It is a joy uh, to be back with you today. Um, many, so, some of you may remember that I was here just about a year ago, but my connection to this congregation actually goes back into the 1990s when I was a youth intern here for two summers and am really grateful for the life and influence of this congregation. I was able to study scripture and go on mission trips and grow in relationship with uh, those emerging adults. And here's my recollection is that in those days, we had the coolest room in this whole building. There's a lot of rooms in this building, right? But we had the upstairs room, the only upstairs room. We loved it. Um, and I'm really grateful to be back here. So Noe and Doug and I just did spend a week in St. Louis where we were at the General Assembly, which is the highest council of the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, there are just about 600 voting commissioners at that assembly. Donegal Presbytery sends four. We send two teaching elders and two ruling elders. And of those four, you sent two. I mean, you sent half of the Donegal uh, Presbytery contingent, Doug and Noe, and I brought pictures of them. Look at that. There's Noe working really hard, all right? And there's Doug working really hard. So really, really grateful for uh, both of them and their work there over the course of that week. You would have been extraordinarily proud of their thoughtfulness and their engagement and their wisdom. Doug also serves as the present moderator of Donegal Presbytery. We are extraordinarily grateful, Doug, for your leadership and for your steadiness and for your calm wisdom. Thank you for that um, very, very much. Uh, just over a year ago, Aaron Cox Holmes and I, over the course of about a month, spent four weeks with you where we s preached a number of sermons. And here's a little test. You learned with, anybody remember? Lydia. Do you remember learning with Lydia? All right. You were exuberant in... Oh, yes! You know, it's a little risky, right, to ask the question, because, but yeah, all right, great. You, we rumbled with... Yes. And you, so we rumbled with Ruth, and you journeyed with Jonah. Good job. It does a preacher's heart good to come back a whole year later. And even if somebody remembers one word, right, that is great. So in that spirit, today we are going to jump on Joseph, all right? So everybody stand up. If you're able, stand up. On three, I want you to jump, all right? One, two, three. Oh, good job. All right, have a seat. At some point, friends, life's going to jump on you, if it, already ha if it hasn't already. And at some point, if you grow in faith in life, you and I look around and we say, I've got a hand in that. Hear now these words of Holy Scripture. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers, he was a helper to the sons of Bilah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father, to their father. First thing we find out about Joseph is his first words. This guy's a tattletale. Now Israel, that's, that's, that's Joseph's father, loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all their, his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed 
to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brothers, saying, look, I've had another dream. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Friends, would you pray with me? Gracious God, we want to attend to your word. And so we ask that your word would attend to our lives and speak to us with grace and with truth that we might become more and more people who serve and love you and your world. Amen. Somehow, every single one of us needs to, in some way, come to terms with a world that eventually lands on us. It may happen in your youth if your family life is difficult. It may happen as a young adult when your job dissolves suddenly. It may happen in middle age if a relationship goes south. It may happen at any age if your health all of a sudden ceases to be robust. We all eventually come to terms with a world that lands on us. And if we mature, we also become people who recognize our own hand in that. Friends, life is fragile. This world is fragile, both the environment and also the worlds we construct, but you need not be. We know that because of the cross of Jesus Christ, where suffering, nails, and even death are not enough. But we also know that from this extraordinary story, where over the arc of a life, Joseph goes from being shallow to being expansive, from being narrow to being wide, from being centered on himself to caring for an entire land, even people who have wronged him. Yesterday in St. Louis, as we were headed back to the airport, I and two of my colleagues, not Doug or Noe, but two other colleagues, got an Uber. And I don't know if you know this, but when you get Uber, you look and it tells you a little bit about the driver. Our driver's name was Sarah, and there's a little description. It tells you about your driver, and it said, Sarah is a great conversationalist. Now, I am the type of person, when I am done nine days of being around 600 people, I'm not looking for a great conversationalist, all right? I like you. I mean, so I love people. I love I loved meeting you all, but yesterday, not so much. So I got in the back seat and looked out the window. But Sarah's a great conversationalist. So she started to tell us about her life. And as she started to tell us about her life, I looked around the car and I noticed that the uh, little console at the, at the top of the car was kind of hanging down. I mean, this car was fine, but it wasn't in great shape. She told us that driving Uber is her second job. She's trying to make ends meet. She told us about a couple of relationships that haven't worked out and the heartache that's been. And she told us about her kids, whom she dearly loves, particularly her 17-year-old son. I've got a 17-year-old son, so then my head ripped around, 17-year-old son. And she says, yeah, my 17-year-old son, who occasionally does his homework. 
That's a great description of a lot of 17-year-old sons that I know. She says, I love him, and I'm concerned about him, and I'll do anything for him. Just wide open, love in the world. So then she asked us about us. We admitted we were preachers. And she said, oh, what are you preaching tomorrow? And then the three of us started to shuffle our feet like 17-year-old boys that haven't done much homework. (laughs) And we said, oh, we're going home. We're going to work really hard on our sermons tonight. Really hard. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. You got to preach from the heart. She she said, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Okay? She said, you got to tell him how much God loves him. you got to preach from the heart. So I brought Sarah with me today. No. <laughs> we got out of the car, and one of my colleagues turned to me and said, she told us we can wing it tomorrow, right? <laughs> what she told us is that no matter what, friends, your life, my life, our lives can experience extraordinary hardship and still be wide open, wide open with and to and for the love of God for this world. It is common, even possible, and we would love it for the Bible to tell us how to live a good life. And people are longing for those kinds of directions. But I want to tell you, that is not the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is describing the interrupting grace of God into your life, into my life, into our lives, often when it is unwanted. You can read this passage, and I suppose you can get some lessons about how not to parent. And by inference, some lessons how to parent. But that's not the purpose of this passage. This purpose passage and Joseph's life demonstrates to us our need and the mechanism by which God's grace interrupts our lives, comes into it, and opens us from focusing on ourselves to being wide open, wide open. People who stand tall, even when life has jumped on them. I mean, you heard this passage. Joseph at 17 is pretty gifted and pretty interested in himself. He's got a talent. He can interpret dreams. But he doesn't have maturity. So he stands up and says, guess what my dreams told me? I'm pretty important. How do you like them apples? And you heard what his family says. They say, not so much. Joseph goes on from this passage here to his brothers hating him so much that some of them want to kill him. And just a few say, no, 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 don't kill him. Throw him in a pit. Don't leave him to die. Just sell him off into slavery. How about that, huh? He goes off to the land of Egypt. Where he rides a talented guy. He's a great administrator. He runs afoul of somebody else, not so much uh, in the next story, ends up in prison. In prison, two other people have dreams. He interprets those dreams. Those interpretations lead him to interpret the dreams of the Pharaoh. He's just he's a talented guy. And every single time in, this, in, the, in Genesis, when he interprets a dream, he becomes less and less about himself and more and more about the good of the world. Every single time. Until he ends up in charge of Egypt when a famine strikes and these very brothers who have tried to kill him show up begging for food. And then Joseph, who at 17 was proud that the world would bow down before him, has gained the maturity, even though life has jumped on him again and again and again to say words that shape the trajectory of of, of Scripture. He says to his brothers, you know, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, that people might benefit. 
Joseph is able to look back over the suffering of his life and not be bitter. He is able to look back over the hardships of his life and not be narrow. He is able to look back over the extraordinarily difficult things that have happened to him, real things, difficult things, genuine suffering, and say to people where he is in an opportunity to punish them, I forgive you. I love you. Do you not long to use the power that you have in this world for the benefit of those around you? Do you not long to look around your own life and say even the bad things that have happened, even the evil things that have happened, God has taken them and meant them for good so this world might benefit. If that's the case, you and I cannot look back over the suffering of our lives. We cannot look back at the times that life has jumped on us and say, I'm going to get even. I'm going to punish people. I'm bitter. No, no, no. You have to have a wide open, expansive view of God who takes the stories of your life and my life and this world, even when they're difficult, and said, God's going to use them for good. When I was in school, I had a, a young gentleman who lived in the room next to me whose name was Rich. Rich was from New York. Specifically, he was from Staten Island, and for whatever reason, we decided to call him Cabby. I don't know why. Looked like a cabbie. We were from the country. We figured everybody in Staten Island uses cabs. I don't know, but we called him Cabby, all right? Cabby rarely studied. And so when the semester would end, Cabby would look at his grades and he would say, I'm in trouble. And then at the school I was at, we had a reading week. That's what they called it, a reading week. Classes were over, they gave us a week to read before we took exams. Young adults don't read during reading week, right? You know that. Cabby would go to mass every day during reading week, and here's what he would say to us. He would say, I gotta go see the big guy. Always pointed, I gotta go see the big guy. He'd come back from mass, and we'd say, how was mass? And he would say, uh, I don't know. There were a lot of people there. I'm not sure my prayers got through. That's a vision of God, right? It's a vision of God that God's available to help. Maybe, maybe. Contrast that with, um, I think the children are going to sing it for, for VBS at the other ones. I love it when I see children's choir. My favorite children's song is My God is So Big. Do you know that song? My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And there's motions, all right? My God is so big, all right? So strong and so mighty. And I, what, what I love are when the little boys get to be big. My God is so big! It's a vision of God, too. A God who is above us and beyond us and who cares for us and who can redeem even the times that life has jumped upon us. That's the key. Life's going to jump. It's going to land. It's going to be challenging. You, friends, and I, we choose to. We choose how we see God in the midst of that so that we might end life wide open for the gospel supposed to be done, right, Noe? It's a bummer. Well, I don't know if it's a bummer for you. <laughs> um, friends, it's a delight to be with you and um, your extraordinary congregation. I'm personally grateful for your influence in my life. 
grateful for your uh, influence in our Presbyterian, our broader denomination, grateful for the leadership that you have, but with you, grateful for the God who is big and beyond us, no matter what lands, for our sake. Let me pray with you and for you. God, thank you for all those who are gathered here. Uh, bless this congregation and bless especially those people who today arrived saying life, life's landed hard. God, give us eyes to see your grace and your goodness even then.